Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting video 19.1 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This video discusses how to manage PCI of heavily calcified lesions. There are 14 steps in percutaneous coronary intervention, and several of those steps are affected when treating heavily calcified lesions. And the reason is because calcification can affect equipment delivery. It can also affect how the lesions expand and can also lead to complications such as dissection and perforation. So we'll discuss each step one by one. First of all, starting with planning. Doing PCI in heavily calcified lesions can be challenging for all the reasons that were just mentioned. As a result, it is best to start by using large guide catheters. Seven and eight friends are preferred with strong guide support, AL for the right, EBU or XP for the left. Also, intravascular imaging is very important, both for determining the severity of calcification, but also for ensuring that an excellent standing result has been achieved. And finally, there is high likelihood that atherectomy or other plaque modification strategies are going to be needed when treating heavily calcified lesions. Given the increased risk of complications such as dissection, perforation, and device loss, there's need for careful monitoring throughout the case, both the patient's hemodynamics as well as the equipment and the guide position during the case. In terms of pharmacology, if atherectomy is performed, then vasodilators should generally be given unless the patient is hypotensive before the procedure so as to dilate the small distal arterioles and facilitate passage of the debris that are released during atherectomy. Also, if there is concern for bradycardia, one pharmacologic way for preventing bradycardia is to use aminophilin, which is an adenosine receptor blocker, at a dose of 250 milligrams over 10 minutes that can prevent bradycardia during atherectomy. However, most operators currently do not use aminophilin or use a temporary pacemaker. Instead, they do a test run to see if the patients develop significant bradycardia, and if not, they perform the atherectomy without actually taking those measures to prevent bradycardia. So once again, no pacemaker is what is done in many cases today, but if there is significant bradycardia with atherectomy, then a temporary pacer or aminophilic can be used. In terms of access, either femoral or radial access can be used. Ideally, seven friends or eight friends guide catheters are used to obtain extra support. Also, these larger guide catheters can facilitate equipment delivery and also facilitate management of complications should they occur. In terms of engagement, it is important to get strong guide catheter support. Once again, large guide catheters, supportive shapes, and ensuring coaxial alignment is important, especially when atherectomy and especially when doing PCI of osteal calcified lesions. This is an example of a heavily calcified osteal right coronary artery lesion. There's another lesion in the mid right coronary artery. In that case, uh, uh, there was uh, orbital atherectomy as the preferred treatment. The Viper wire flex tip was used down the vessel. And then instead of doing atherectomy going in, that carries the risk of the crown having an uncontrolled rotation. Instead, the crown was advanced through the vessel and then atherectomy was done coming back, ensuring that the guide is coaxial with the vessel. Then the procedure was finalized with an osteal flush balloon with a nice final result and TM3 flow. In terms of angiography, angiography is what we use to, de to detect calcification. However, it is notoriously poorly sensitive for finding calcium. The common definition of uh, moderate and severe calcium have to do with uh, dense radio opacities. If they can be seen on both sides of the arterial wall without cardiac motion, then that's severe calcium. If uh, they, are, they can be seen in the cardiac cycle before administering contrast, then this is moderate calcifications if they affect only one side of the vessel. 
Sometimes calcification is obvious, as in this case, so for right coronary artery CTO. However, sometimes, especially in patients who are obese and the image quality is not perfect, then calcification detection may be suboptimal. And that's where intravascular imaging can help. In terms of determining the target lesion, angiography can be difficult to interpret in the presence of severe calcification, as shown in the study, in which uh, when there was no significant calcium, there was a good correlation between FFR and the angiographic percent stenosis. However, the correlation was much uh, less in patients who had a significant calcification. Therefore, functional assessment might be particularly useful for determining the significance of heavily calcified lesions. This is another example of coronary angiography in a heavily calcified LAD. There is also calcification on the right. And then here, all the lesion does not appear to be angiographically very significant. Uh, by using functional assessment, there was uh, a significant lesion with a diffuse step up suggesting that uh, PCI might be a suboptimal option here because the vessel was diffusely diseased. Step number eight, wiring. This can be challenging through calcium. And whenever there is challenging wire, one way to get over this difficulty is to use a microcatheter. If workhorse wires do not work, which is uh, more likely to occur if there is calcium and tortuosity, then using of either hydrophilic wires, such as the Sion wire or the Minamo wire or the run-through, that can help. Or alternatively, a polymer jacketed wire can be used. But then if those polymer jacketed wires are used, they should ideally be replaced for workhorse wire before delivering balloons and stents, especially because calcium makes delivery difficult and therefore there is often back and forth wire movement when equipment is being delivered. If there is still significant difficulty delivering, supportive wires, for example, the Grand Slam or the Mailman or the Ironman or the Wiggle wire that has this special pattern can help uh, deliver equipment through areas of calcium. And of course, to perform a therectomy, a dedicated guide wire has to be used, which is the Viper wire for orbital and the Rota wire for rotational therectomy. The standard techniques for wiring apply to calcified lesions. If uh, there is a bifurcation, then using large bands helps, uh, or an angulated microcatheter. If there is a tough band, the reverse guide wire technique can be used, or the deflection and balloon technique can be used as well. There are two types of Viper wire, which is the wire for orbital atherectomy, the standard one, and the one with flex tip, that is a nitinol wire, and this is much easier to deliver through areas uh, of uh, significant disease. When it comes to rotational atherectomy, there is the rota wire floppy that is used in the vast majority of cases, with the rota wire extra support used mainly for treating osteal RCA lesions. When it comes to lesion preparation, this is a critical step for heavily calcified lesions. Those lesions should never be approached with primary stenting because that's when stenanter expansion and other problems such as stent loss may occur. There are many ways to prepare the lesion that is heavily calcified, starting with standard balloons and non-compliant balloons, starting with uh, plaque modification balloons such as the angiosculpt, the cutting balloon and the chocolate, atherectomy, both orbital and rotational, and new tools such as intravascular lithotripsy, which is not available as of 2020 in the US, but will likely be available next year, as well as the very high pressure balloon, the SIS OPN balloon. How can the balloon efficacy be improved? By using high pressures that applies to non-compliant balloons, doing prolonged infl inflations for more than one minute or two minutes. If uh, body wires are used, that has an effect similar to that of the plaque modification balloons. And then if we see that the pressure of the end of later keeps on decreasing slowly, that means that uh, the lesion is expanding and therefore prolonging the duration of the inflation may be beneficial. If, however, there is rapid drop in pressure, that means balloon rupture, which is more likely to occur in calcified lesions. And in those cases, the balloon should be immediately deflated and removed, followed by angiography to make sure that we don't have any perforation.
Balloon angioplasty of heavily calcified lesions can have complications. Balloon rupture we just discussed, perforation of the vessel, dissection of the vessel, and even balloon entrapment in heavily calcified and tortuous vessel. The things to look for are the expansion of the balloon. If the balloon continues to have a waste despite high pressure inflation, this is not the time to place a stent, but additional modification of the lesion is needed prior to actually uh, implanting a stent. Also, balloon movement. Sometimes the balloon may have movement, the so-called watermelon seeding uh, phenomenon, in which the balloon slips proximal or distal. And then intravascular imaging is important to determine both the severity of the lesion as well as to see if sufficient modification has been achieved. When should we start with the balloon versus start with a therectomy? This is a question that uh, continues to be asked quite often. But in general, if there is significant calcification, in the absence of significant tortuosity or thrombus or dissection or in bypass grafts, uh, using an upfrontotherectomy technique might help improve the outcomes. Alternatively, balloon angioplasty can be performed, and if it fails, for example, the balloon doesn't cross or the balloon does not expand properly, then secondary atherectomy can be performed. But once again, stents should not be placed unless the lesion is pr uh, properly prepared to optimize stent delivery and stent expansion. When a therectomy is being performed, there are two key questions. The first one is, is there a need for temporary pacemaker? And the second one, whether hemodynamic support is needed. As we discussed before, most of the time we don't use a temporary pacemaker currently. Instead, a test run is being done. If uh, there is no significant bradycardia, that's it. A therectomy is done without pacemaker. If, however, there is severe bradycardia, then either aminophilin can be used or a temporary pacer. These are examples of secondary atherectomy in which balloon angioplasty failed. Uh, there is a diffuse disease in the right coronary artery. It was balloon, but there was a waste remaining of the balloon despite, despite high pressure balloon inflations. So atherectomy was done, orbital atherectomy in this case, that then allowed adequate expansion of the balloon. And now the balloon expands, then a stent was placed with uh, a nice final result. So this is an example of where a therectomy wasn't done up front, but it was done after failure of the balloon to dilate the lesion. This is another example. This is a heavily calcified and tortured lesion in the LAD as well as a diagonal branch. This was uh, very hard to cross, and even a 1.5 millimeter balloon had a very hard time getting there. Eventually it did get there, but nothing else could be done and actually the attempts were stopped. The patient came back seven months later with severe medical refractory angina. There is even worse stenosis at this time in this LAD and diagonal. And this time after a workhorse wire was used to wire, a microcatheter was used to exchange the wire for the rota floppy wire, followed by rotational atherectomy. It took several runs of rotational therectomy to actually be able to cross the lesion due to significant calcification and tortuosity. But again, after 10 runs, then eventually the, the burr um, did go through uh, the lesion, and then eventually a nice result was achieved with timothy flow and uh, relief of the patient's symptoms. Should one do orbital or rotational atherectomy? That's also a common question. And uh, in most cases, either modality can provide good results. However, if there are previous stents, especially fresh stents, rotational atherectomy is preferred. Although any atherectomy can cause complications if done within stents, especially fresh stents. Although there are studies in all stents that either rotational or orbital can have good outcomes. For balloon uncrossable lesions, the rotational atherectomy has potentially the benefit because of the front cutting mechanism. Whereas when it comes to large vessels, then orbital has a potential benefit because due to its mechanism of action, it can more effectively modify those larger vessels. Regardless of modality, there are some key concepts and principles when doing atherectomy. The first one is uh, that um, the atherectomy runs should be brief. And I personally suggest that they are kept 15 seconds or less. 
the orbital atherectomy gives a warning at 25 seconds. However, I try to keep those much shorter if possible. Long runs have the disadvantage that you release a lot of debris, increasing the risk of distal embolization. So keeping atherectomy runs brief is important. The other one is to leave enough time between the atherectomy runs for the debris to get through the microcirculation. And this is analogous to what happens when flour is being dumped into the sink and then water is running. If the flour is dumped in small quantities, there is enough time for it to go down the drain with the water. But if too much flour is dumped at once, then there can be plugging of the sink. So in a similar way, leaving long periods of time, at least 30 seconds or one minute or more, allows for the microcirculation to recover and prevents plugging of the microvessels and uh, uh, adverse outcomes in that way. There will be specific videos actually discussing the specific technique for both rotational and orbital atherectomy. Moving on to standing. Once again, standing should never happen before there is great lesion preparation. If standing is done, then the next step is to perform high pressure balloon post dilatation and to use intravascular imaging to ensure that an excellent stenting result has been achieved. There are some rare cases, especially for osteo lesions, when there is stent recoil. And in such cases, potentially using a peripheral stent that has high radial force can be considered. Finally, there are the stent boost and clear stent modalities, which are x ray post processing post-processing techniques that can improve the visualization of stents after they have been deployed. When it comes to physiology, as we discussed, it is important because the angiogram can be hard to interpret in the presence of significant calcification, so using physiology can help determine the functional significance of those lesions. Imaging is also critical. Angiogram underestimates the presence and severity of calcium. Detecting calcium is easy, both by IVUS and OCT. This is the IVUS appearance where there is um, white hyperdense um, um, structure with shadowing behind the calcium. And that's a disadvantage of IVUS that it cannot look at the depth and thickness of calcium. In contrast, OCT, in which calcium appears as a dark area that is low backscatter and uh, low attenuation, the, has very sharp, well defined borders. In contrast to lipid, that is also low backscatter, is dark, but does not have well-defined borders. So because the infrared light can penetrate through calcium, using OCT allows assessment of both the presence as well as the arc, as well as the thickness of the calcium. And there is actually one score by OCT that can be used to determine the need of atherectomy. If uh, there is uh, more than 180 degrees arc that favors atherectomy, so does if there is more than half millimeter thickness, and if the length is more than five millimeters, if all those points are present, which is a score of four, there is a high likelihood of stand under expansion. And for those lesions, doing atherectomy uh, should be highly recommended. Also, imaging can be done after plaque modification is being performed. This is an example of uh, imaging after atherectomy, showing modification of the calcium that then facilitated subsequent stent expansion. And finishing up with step number 14, hemodynamic support. This should be considered in PCI of heavily calcified lesions because for the, re for the reasons we mentioned, those are more complex procedures. Distal embolization can happen can have issues with perforation or dissection. So there should be a lower threshold for using hemodynamic support, especially in patients who have poor hemodynamics, low ejection fraction. There is atherectomy or angioplasty of a large uh, uh, coronary artery supplying a large area of myocardium, especially if there is significant valve disease, disease or pulmonary hypertension. So to summarize, PCI of heavily calcified lesions can be challenging in many ways. And paying careful attention to planning, having strong guide support, adequately preparing the lesion before delivering a stent, and using intravascular imaging to ensure that an excellent result has been achieved are the uh, key concepts and principles 
that need to be applied in PCI of those lesions. Thank you very much.